It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. This is another episode of Frontline Friday's with my special guest, Bridget Gleason. Bridget, how are you doing today? Andy, excellent. I shook it up a little bit. I went for a swim today. <laughs> for people that are keeping track of our exercise. I know, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. I recognize that. No, I, 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 I care. I think everybody's keeping a log probably for it's us. It's all part of the discipline thing. I think sales is all about, one of the key things in sales is discipline. I think routine is important. Habits. I think getting in habits. habits are important. We've talked about. So I just want everybody to know I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid. Perfect. That's what I want people to know. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. It I'm making it. I'm drinking it. Good. All about habits. That's great. Good habits. Hopefully, as opposed to bad habits. Unfortunately, <laughs> sales, it, yeah, I think, uh, is equally about bad habits as well. But that's yeah, why I've we're here. Is, that's why we're here is to help. That's right. With the bad habits. That's right. And so we're actually going to talk about one of those bad habits today. And it's what I like to call sales biases. And I think we all have filters, right, that we use to judge certain situations that we're getting into. And in sales, one of the most common biases that that people have is when they encounter a new prospect and they say, oh, these guys are just like this other company I dealt with. So I'm going to do the same thing here that I did there. And you get sort of this, I said, you look at things through a filter. And once you start doing that, then you stop really being alive, as I like to say, to the possibilities of what's different and the value you can bring to them, the insights you can bring that help differentiate you. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I do think that pattern recognition is still important, but I think your point, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that sometimes we take that we take that too far when it's when it's goes beyond recognition and it really is, like you said, a bias. And it's just like, this looks like customer XYZ, so I'm going to do the same thing, as opposed to using it just as a, a pattern and a framework and then operating within that framework. Yeah, so I think one of the primary ways that this hurts salespeople is that they, they become reliant on this, we'll call it pattern recognition, and they start or they stop, excuse me, they start to stop learning because I know what to do. These people are just like these other people I spoke with. And the fact is nobody, and we've we talked about this, if not the last episode, the episode before, is that no two prospects are ever precisely alike. And therefore, how you sell to them, how you message to them in your, as you as a sales professional, how you're dealing with them, the questions you ask me, the spin you put on the questions – be slightly different. And if you're not aware of what those differences need to be, if you're not paying attention to these and sort of removing your your filters, then yeah, you could be completely off base. You know, I I always sort of harken harken back to the story my my dad would talk about uh you know, he was a navigator on a bomber in World War II and they're flying (laughs) certainly didn't have the you know complex navy navigation systems that modern pilots have. And and so he was chartered as a very young, almost like a teenager, to navigate a plane from this fly spec in the open Pacific, Guam, to Japan and back. And if he was off by half a degree, right, they're going to be hundreds of miles away from their, their return destination. So uh, to me, it's sort of like the same thing. You, you just, you know, if you just miss that 1% difference, that 2% variation, you could be way off the mark when it comes to finding and determining and defining a solution for the prospect that that they can buy into. Yeah, I think this is I think this is hard for the current individual contributor sales reps and here's why is because I think all the messaging 
and the training and everything that we give as managers from where I sit, the VP level on down, we're pushing for standardization. We're pushing for scripts. We're pushing for process. We're pushing for look for these. We're pushing for these are the templates to use. This is the cadence to use. So I, I, I think it's hard for, if I, were, if I were a sales rep, an individual contributor listening to this conversation that we're having, Andy, mm-hmm. I would feel very conflicted because I would feel, well, on one hand, management is telling me, do it this way. It looks like this. Find the pattern. Uh, if it looks like this, here's the template you should use. Here are the questions you should ask. Here's the, and we're on one hand, and I'm using we because I'm sure I am a guilty participant pushing them towards this more mechanization, less alive. And yet what we're talking about is, okay, yeah, you're getting pushed to have this framework but within that, you need to still treat each one differently. And I think it's possible to hold the two and do the two. But I think that needs to be called out because otherwise this would, if I were listening, this would be very confusing to me. Well, and I think part of it too is defining, I think this is a discussion a little more targeted toward uh, account execs, outside reps, and so on necessarily than sales development reps, but it, it's it's true there as well though. Um you know, cause, you know, one But I'm thing- not even talking sales development reps. I'm not even talking sales development reps. There's a lot that's being done that is templated, not sure. to the same degree as sales development reps. No, I understand. But even but even for an account executive. Yeah, no, I agree. I I've seen it. I mean it's so but here's here's one of the challenges, right? Is that is that the act of selling to your prospect changes them as they become more educated and informed of which you are helping them do that. Oftentimes, they change. Requirements can slightly change. You know, they're they're, and I'm not just talking about. You know, a challenger sale perspective, or a challenge there, but you can certainly take that into account here. Is buyers' perspectives of what constitutes the optimum solution, or the best solution, or the good enough solution for them, even necessarily changes when you sell to them? So, if you think that everybody everybody fits the same template, you know, by by virtue of selling to people, they are changing. And if you're so, if you have said, if you have your biases up then you're going to miss that. And your competitors, who perhaps I said are a little more alive to this possibility of this change taking place, if they don't have their biases in in place in the same way, I said they may steal a march on you. They may find themselves in this opportunity in the lead position where you thought you had a really good opportunity. Yeah, and I, I agree. This, again, this discussion we're having, this is the a, phrase that comes to mind is the tyranny of or. And mm-hmm. I don't think this is an or situation. I think this is, there are going to be some patterns that you want to recognize, but you want to make sure that you are still fluid and creative and thinking. And I like how you frame that, Andy, that in the course of the conversation and the sales process, they're changing in that it's a dance. And they're changing. And so it will start to look different. And sometimes that outcome is not going to be the same or look exactly the same, the requirements or whatever, as somebody that you uh, encountered in a a situation that was similar, but not the same. Yeah. So, I mean, a a bias, if you take the dictionary definition, it's it's the, I have it here somewhere, it's the inclination to hold a partial perspective at the expense of possibly valid alternatives. Great. So, will you read that? Will you read that again? <laughs> the inclination to hold a partial perspective at the expense of possibly valid alternatives. 
I love that. Possibly valid alternatives. I think that's the key. You don't want to have a bias that's going to prevent you from seeing what the different alternatives are, what the possible solutions are, what the possible paths are. Well, here, yeah, and so that's here, when it goes from a that that's that's I think when it, a bias I guess is when I guess you want to be careful when a pattern and recognizing the pattern turns into a bias, which from the definition creates some blindness. Oh, exactly. So here's here's a, a good example, and I, I can't remember if I brought this up before, but uh, yeah, my wife is an educator, a medical educator at a medical school. And, uh, yeah, I remember hearing, I think from her and I think possibly from her daughter that was attending med school as well is that, that, uh, they'd heard about a study of doctors in which they identified literally dozens of biases, predispositions, if you will, that the doctors unconsciously use as filters when they evaluate and diagnose patients. So, you know, one of the stories that that they told me was about a you know physician to any patient, let's say, if they had a perception, let's say, of the income level, or if they thought the patient was um, indigent or a transient coming in, their bias was first of all to say, well, whenever they say they're not feeling well, they're lying. And that was that was like you know that was held by a, a large percentage of people in the studies, physicians. The study is is sort hmm. of repeatable. Is they looked at people, they made hmm. they formed an assessment based hmm. on the person, what uh-huh. little information they could gather quickly about the person, and then filtered what they said based on that perception, which had no, really no bearing. You could say with reality, though undoubtedly at some point at some point in time, some of those filters were correct. Yeah, if you have enough of them. Yeah. You know, so even that, a blind squirrel finds a nut occasionally. Right, so that's where the pattern recognition comes in. But the fact is that here, you know, in that example, healthcare is even just, you know, doing that in one instance could cost somebody their life, right? So we're not right. dealing with life and death with sales, but... Um, Although sometimes we feel like it. Yeah, certainly we feel sometimes like it. Sometimes we act like it. <laughs> well, certainly at the end of the quarter is when it seems like life and death, although it's not. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've been through those situations um, where calling customers at home at 9 o'clock on a Friday night at the end of the quarter. Um, I'm sure they loved it. Oh, they loved it, yeah. yeah. It's always a good way to. I'm sure. Always, always mm-hmm. a good way to build a relationship with a prospect. But, That's right. That's right. Stalk them at home. Right. When you have your CEO standing in the doorway of your office while you're doing that, not leaving till you'd get it done, then. Uh, but anyway, you know, there, you just you can't let these biases come into play. I mean, you can't look at a prospect. And probably one of the best examples of this in sales that we see all the time is with, you know, historically, sort of with marketing generated leads, right? And salespeople saying, yeah, that leads to marketing. All marketing leads are crap. I mean, you've curly. That is an excellent example. Right? They don't even look at them. But their bias says, yeah, they're all crap. Oh, yeah. God, that's such a good example. I will say it, I, I have managed teams. And again, I, I'll, I'll put myself in that pool of guilty, guilty. Is, yeah, I, you develop a bias that, yeah, they're not any good. We, we do the same thing to our prospects when we send crappy emails to them. We train them. We, we, we train them. We help them develop a bias that everything we send is junk. Yeah. We have to be careful about that because we, we help create biases also, right. negative biases. Right. And because we're acting, we're acting out of the, a sense of those same biases and filters in sending them those crappy emails. Right? I mean, that's, True. yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. We're sort of self reinforcing in, in that cycle. So, yeah, the question really becomes is, you know, how do we how do we identify these biases and as sales professionals, and then how do we work to eliminate them or to minimize them as much as we can? I mean, we're humans, right? We're not going to be perfect in this, but to the extent that we can, you know, what are the things that we can do to help uh, sort of eliminate as many of these as we can from our selling as possible? 
You know, I, I think I don't have a, uh, you know, foolproof solution to it, but I think the first step in many cases like this, when you're trying to change a habit or change a behavior, whatever it is, is you just identify it and name it first. So when you can recognize it, oh, that's a bias I have. That often is the first step in changing a behavior, changing a habit. And so I would say that here is, is, a, is a great first step. Ah, that's a bias I have. Oh my God, I'm treating it the same way. Let me look and see if there are things that are, are different that I should pay attention to. But if we don't even recognize we have the bias, if we're really, um, if we don't have that level of self-awareness, then it's, I mean, obviously, I don't know how you change it. Not well, aware. Right. So let's, let's talk about that. Create awareness. Cause that's a great, great place to start is to me, if you are in a position where you're, <laughs> you're in sales, whether it's inside, outside, whatever, but you start thinking to yourself, God, I've had the same conversation. I'm so sick and tired of having the same conversation. I've had the same conversation with prospects, you know, for the hundredth time in the last you know month then maybe that's a sign that, geez, you're not really present, right? You're not really thinking about these people as individuals because you've had the exact same conversation a hundred times in the last two months. Because not everybody's the same. It can't possibly be from a probability standpoint that everybody's requirements and their decision-making process, the way they gathered information, evaluated information about making decisions was identical. So by, yeah, by, de- by definition, your conversations should have been different. Doesn't mean there couldn't have been similarity, but you shouldn't be thinking <laughs> when you're getting ready to talk to this customer like it's the, you know the thirtieth time you watch that particular rerun of Friends and you know the lines by heart. Right here we go again. Here we go again, and boy, am I sick and tired of this. So I think if you've reached that point, you always have to. Be able to, you know, indulge in some introspection and say, yeah, that's probably on me. You know, and I'm, I'm not treating each one of these prospects as individuals. I'm not optimizing my chances of winning this business because, you know, I'm just sort of making huge assumptions about, about every aspect of them, right? I know what they want. I know what the requirements are. Um, yeah, I know how they evaluate products. I know how they make decisions. Hey, they're all the same. And the fact is, they're not. So I talk about this in, in my last book, Amp Up Your Sales, is that selling is a deliberate process. It's not a robotic process. It's not an automatic process. It's a deliberate process. You have to make decisions every step along the way. I 100% agree. That's what makes it so interesting. Yeah. That's what, what makes it interesting. And, and you know... It, We've had this conversation several times about is the job of salesperson going away. If it becomes, if it truly could work, if we were just robotic, well, then we could use robots. You wouldn't need people. But that's not the case because there are nuances and there are things don't go just in one set pattern and routine. And that's actually the fun of it. Mm-hmm. For me, is that it's different. It's not. It's not an assembly line. I'm not doing the same thing. It's not the same conversation. It's I can be selling the same product to the same market segment to the same title of the buyer, and each one feels different. And there's this human connection. It's a different person. And I think that's that connection piece is also for me what's very interesting and very important. Well, yeah, you know, I think that's, that's really to the essence of how salespeople continue to be relevant is that they're, they're adding something of value to their prospects. And they can only add something of value to their prospects if they truly, truly engage with them you know, in, a, in a way that, right. that is unique and is not, oh, um, you know, I'm just going to go through the motions and hope this one works out. So one, yeah, it's, it's the fun of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think 
part of the perspective that people have to have is in in the sales profession is that you know their experience their career is a work in process a work yeah. in progress and that we're never finished we're never finished products we've never i mean it's like saying uh, you know maybe a little bit clumsy and you know analogy but it's like saying yeah i've mastered golf well no one's ever mastered the game of golf right um, not nobody I know. Yeah, I mean the people. Yeah, it's part of the reason people are still attracted to playing it is you know this possibility of of improving, mm. possibility of of this great shot they hit that they'd never had the chance to hit before, being in certain situations. Well, I mean, sales is really the same way, right? I mean, you're it's something that you're never going to completely, completely, hundred percent right. master. You can master it to some degree. You can achieve mastery, but it doesn't mean that you're a complete master and and so as long as you're thinking about gosh there's always something i can learn from every sales opportunity that's how i look at it I mean, every time i deal with a prospect that's an opportunity for me to learn and as long as i have that that mindset and i turn that into the habit of being open and asking the right questions and treating everybody as a unique opportunity then you continue to to build on what you know and and achieve even greater levels of mastery. Yeah, I think it's why curiosity is such a great quality to look for in a salesperson, because having natural curiosity just leads you there without having to even try. If you're just naturally curious about uh, a prospect and who they are and this the specifics of their challenge and what's different and that curiosity and having a mindset of curiosity because that can also be uh nurtured uh i think is is really helpful in a salesperson yeah and and playing off that curiosity that's why i think one of the most effective techniques to fight your biases is to ask really great questions Mm. And and questions that really are, are somewhat, you know, unique, almost every every prospect. I mean, there's going to be a little bit of a nuance, as you talked about, a little bit of a spin. And and there was a great sort of question or phrase. Uh, yeah, I just did interviewed uh, Brent Adamson from the Challenger Sale Challenger Customer, one of the co-authors. And you know, I was talking about how questions you ask customers questions that that are about something they should know, something about their business that they should know, but don't. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, if you could ask a question, you know, think about that. If you're a prospect and salesperson's asking you something about your business that they don't know, but think, gosh, I really should know that, then, wow, that's a great question. That's going to keep you engaged as a sales professional. That's going to keep you engaged every time you ask that question because the answer is going to be different every time. And the question could be different every time. It could be. But even if you have a great question like that, that has, you know, this combination of, because if it's something that your prospect should know about their business, but don't, that means you've got a level of insight and you're communicating that insight to, by asking the question and then getting the answer. You get to build on that insight for the next time you ask it. Yeah, because, that's true. So it, it becomes even more powerful every time you use it. And, yeah, that's that's okay. Salespeople are thinking, okay, well, how do I find out that question? Well, yeah, you have to go back and talk to your customers, right? I mean, somebody does. I mean, maybe there's something you do in, in conjunction with marketing or or more senior people in sales, but go ask your customers. It's also trial and error. It's also trial and error. Yeah, trial and error but, but if you go yeah, talk to your customers, attention. right? Yeah, and paying attention to how people respond to the questions you ask, mm-hmm. and does it lead to a more insightful? conversation and does it lead to to further engagement it's it's one of the things that i think is really important for salespeople is to do a post-mortem even if it's a quick two minute after a call what worked what didn't how did that sound how far did i get did i meet my objectives but just having that uh discipline to look back and evaluate, you start to see patterns. 
if you don't do that, you just keep moving on. You don't learn from what happened before. But if you start doing that, you'll start to see patterns. And that's when you see, God, that was a good opening, or that was a good line of questioning, or that was a good uh, conversation topic, or whatever it is. Well, I think, yeah, and maybe to spin that just a little bit, I, one of the things that a guest on the show was talking about, which I thought was really uh you know, a very insightful way to look at that is is his contention that even more effective than lost sale analysis was winning sale analysis. So the more that you learn about why somebody bought through your successes, then perhaps, and this is his contention, you could learn by why they didn't buy from you. Because if you learn what you did successfully, then that gives you a chance to go and build on that going forward. And so I thought that was, yeah, I think it's a role for doing both. But I, I think that the, to your point, I think the, the one sale analysis is you rarely hear sales teams talk about it. But I think that perspective is really valuable. What, yeah. did, what did we do that, that let us win this? And, and, and like you said, what did, we, um, what, did we do that, what did we do to let us win it? And what did, what did we learn when we lost it? I think both are super important. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. Yeah, I mean, sort of after action analysis, regardless of the outcome. It's a good way to put it. Good way is, to put it. Yeah, it's really important. And yeah, helps you sort of identify those those biases you may have had, especially in the lost sale analysis, the biases that may have affected your chances of winning. Because part of that analysis may be, well, gosh, you know, why did we lose this deal with ABC Company? Well, we thought they were just like D, E, and F, but um, yeah, it turns out they weren't. I'm going to start paying attention. I have lots of biases. Oh yeah, and I'm sure I'm, I'm sure I do, and I'm sure they're they're preventing me from seeing other viable options. That's our shattering an illusion. I think you're perfect. I know, I know. Lots of people do, but I, I want to set the record straight. <laughs> I want to set, set the record straight for the the people out there that haven't discovered all my foibles quite yet. Okay. Well, gosh, we've, they've only been listening to about fifty episodes so far, so we still. There's lots of time. Lots of time still in this journey to learn more about Bridget. So, Bridget, we're sort of at the end of this uh, this this part of our journey, if we will. Um, any final words of wisdom for our listeners before we sign off for today? Try to identify at least one bias in your next selling day. And I'm sure you can find, you know, I should maybe make the goal harder. But I think identifying one, that's probably a bias that comes up over and over and over. And start with one and just identify it, name it, watch out for it. Yeah, I, what I would do is, to that point, is when you identify what you think is a sales bias, write it down, either on a post-it mm-hmm. note and put it up in your cubicle somewhere or on your desk where you can see it when you're on the phone. Mm. So you're conscious of it, right? Give yourself, give yourself a reminder and have it right there where you can see it. And, you know, maybe even, you know, write enough, I don't know if you, you know, keep a bullet journal or whatever you do for organizing yourself, but, but you write it down somewhere that, that, yeah, you addressed it. This is, you identified it, you addressed it. And, you know, after a week, see where you stand. Excellent. Love the idea. Perfect. Okay. Well, again, Bridget. Thank you, as always, for joining me. And likewise, Andy. And all of, talking to you next time. Yeah, and all of you have spent your time listening to us. Really appreciate it. As always, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send them in to Andy at ZeroTimeSelling.com. And if you don't already, take a minute, go to iTunes, subscribe to this podcast. That way you make sure you don't miss any of my conversations with Bridget as we talk about the most pressing sales issues of the day. So. Until next time, this is Andy Paul and Bridget Gleason saying goodbye. Have a great one. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guests, visit my website at andypaul.com.